Welcome, everybody. Coming at you live from New York. This is Spirit Matters, your daily Bhakti Center podcast. And we are so glad that you are here. My name is Dal Granga, and I'm here with co-host Achita Gopi and Kishore Chandra. Um, how are we doing this morning, crew? Blessed and happy to be here. <laughs> Bless. Bless happy to be here. Sounds like you read that from a list. You have a list of of, of how I'm doing. Uh, I'm blessed. Like you go to therapy and it's like, how are you feeling today? Like, Let me get up my feelings list. Let me see what day it is today. Uh, okay. Well, Tuesday. Wednesday. Oh, today's Wednesday. Today Wednesday? <laughs> today is Wednesday. I've been losing I've been losing track. How are you, Chita? I feel like Captain's log. Day two. <laughs> Incessant rain and cloud cover. Oh man, the cheetah doesn't doesn't do well in the rain in the two p.m. sunsets. Yeah, we'll take shelter of vitamin D later. Vitamin D later. Is it is it gonna let up anytime? Do we have sunshine in the horizon? No, I just have to go to my kitchen and get the vitamin D supplement. <laughs> It's not going to stop. If anybody me. would like to support and send vitamin D supplements, you can send to address below in the link of this podcast. You can also send serotonin filled reels of puppies. <laughs> those I have. My wife and I send those regularly. <laughs> um, we are so glad that you guys are here. Um, this is our daily check in. We're checking in. Make sure you're doing okay. Make sure that you're not feeling too alone. Make sure you're not feeling too disconnected. Um, and one of the ways we do that is by reading the Bhagavad Gita every day, by giving us a little spiritual dose of something to hold on to, um, to give us a little bit of guidance, give us a little bit of reminders. Um, and uh, so we've, we're reading from Bhagavad Gita, and we're in the third chapter. Um, and uh, any announcements or before we dive in? Okay. So we've been on verse eight. We've been having some discussions. I feel like I've been uh, recapping us and teeing us up, but I feel I want to tee that over to you guys. Anybody want to recap us or, or set us up for today other than me? I feel like I'm low on serotonin and vitamin D. <laughs> I can do it. I can okay. do it. <laughs> Says the person who's in Ecuador soaking <laughs> up the serotonin and vitamin D. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's why he's the right person to do it. <laughs> Sometimes in spiritual life, you got to realize when you just don't have it in you. <laughs> and you got to turn it over to someone who does. It's true. My mood has changed tremendously being here in the sun <laughs> and the pool and the heat. <laughs> So we have been talking about Bhagavad Gita in this uh, third chapter, and then specifically, like Dayal said, we've been on verse eight for a while, and we've been talking about um, we've been talking about this balance of understanding that life, that that action and work is going is is a part of life. That it's not like we can just stop being who we are or stop doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, that there will always be something for us to do, and always. Um, be something for us to act in um, and act towards. And Krishna says, you know, that uh, we we can't stop acting even for a moment. Um, this is in verse three or five or something like that um, of this chapter three that we covered and that we are helplessly um, moved by the character, by, by the way that the gunas have, have taken hold in our, in our being. And it's really interesting because we, we ended up talking about this really big concept of nature versus nurture. Um, and we spent some some days on that talking about nature versus nurture, because sometimes it can be easy to say, well, this is my nature. This is how I was raised. This is what I was taught. So so this this is what you get. You know, this is how it is. Deal with it. Deal with it. And um, and so we talked a lot about that. We went into some personal stories of both myself and Achuta because we spoke about um kind of like the nature versus nurture aspect when it comes to the specific lens of being born in a body or in a situation that the rest of society deems um, uh, kind of like on the outskirts or, um, you know, a minority um, and how it looks like to live in that in that life. 
uh, and so we got into some of that and I kept on I kept on trying to kind of um, move into this verse nine because now it's going to start to take a little bit of a shift and we started to talk about a little bit of verse nine but I think we should read verse nine and a couple of verses after that because there's this aspect of this really important topic and aspect of sacrifice um, of doing things not just for my own personal gain and this is really really interesting because I remember a, a a point that I left off on yesterday, or maybe that I mentioned yesterday when we were talking about minority groups and we were talking about all of the stuff that comes with that is these deeper questions um, that, that we, that it behooves us to ask ourselves um, of like, why am I really doing the things that I'm doing? Or who am I doing the things for? So if I'm for, you know, I don't know, like, I don't know, Ecuadorian, Latino, power or whatever <laughs> or if i'm like for you know the gay rights movement or like whatever black black lives matters and this and etc it's like that's all i don't think we're here to to say like you should be doing that or you shouldn't be doing that or any of that because everyone has a personal unique journey but from a spiritualist perspective what's being asked from us um by krishna is like why are we doing the things that we're doing who are we doing the things for um, is this just to satisfy my own personal needs or is it for something bigger? Is it for a, a bigger purpose? Is it for, um, is it for my connection? Is it to reestablish connection with God, with Krishna, um, with my spirit, with my soul, or is this just something that I'm doing to, to, to satisfy kind of base needs? And it's a really, really important question. Um, so before we go on into reading the verses, um, is there anything I wanted to take a pause to see if a chuta dayal if I missed anything, um, or if that's sounds good? I think you should read the verses. Okay, I'm going to read the verses. I think you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ecuadorian power all the way. <laughs> Ecuadorian power all the. I didn't know what to say. I was like, is there an Ecuadorian power movement? I don't even know that. <laughs> I don't know. And I really appreciate that you use the word behoove. I feel like, you know, sometimes there's like a sitcom and there's like something that happens every episode of the sitcom, like someone stubs their toe or somebody says something or you see like a Where's Waldo or whatever. It's like every episode, Kishore uses the word behoove somewhere and we just have to find it. I'm going to find a way to get that word in every episode. It's such a good word. Um, okay, so this is Versus. verse nine. Bhagavad Gita, chapter three, Krishna is saying, work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise, work causes bondage in this material world. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for capital H, his satisfaction. And in that way, you will always remain free from bondage. And I'm going to read a few of these because I feel like they all wrap together nicely. Verse 10 says, in the beginning of creation, the Lord of all creatures sent forth generations of men and demigods, along with sacrifices for Vishnu, and blessed them by saying, be thy ha happy by this yagya or sacrifice, because its performance will bestow upon you everything desirable for living happily and achieving liberation. I'll read like two more. The demigods being pleased by sacrifices will also please you. And thus by cooperation between men and demigods, prosperity will reign for all. In charge of the various necessities of life, the demigods being satisfied by the performance of yagya, sacrifice, will supply all necessities to you. But he who enjoys such gifts without offering them to the demigods in return is certainly a thief. And maybe one last one for good measure. The devotees of the Lord are released from all kinds of sins because they eat food which is offered first for sacrifice. Others who prepare food for personal sense enjoyment verily only eat sin. Hmm. Okay, there's there's a lot of points there, but one, I think the, the major concept here is, again, this question of like Krishna in, in where that verse that we were spending a long time in, in verse eight, saying that that 
that that work is a part of, of life, that you can't even maintain your physical body without work. And so now through these verses, what Krishna is saying is like, actually, there's an art to this work. There's a sacrifice, there's an offering, there's an understanding um, that we have to offer something to, to take. We have to, we have to give to then get back. And so I think, yeah, reciprocity and, reci and reciprocal relationship, I think is really important, Baldevi is saying. And I really like this line in verse 12 um, that Krishna says, but he who enjoys such gifts without offering them to the demigods in return is certainly a thief. And I feel like that's such a, it's such a telltale, like, sign for our times where like we're very you know material life right now is very like how many things can i buy on amazon and i need and i need and black friday sales and just more 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 and it's like our planet is suffering and you know we like see all these like videos of like landfills and craziness and um so it's really interesting this relationship of of giving to receive um but yeah i'd love to hear from all of you i feel like i've been speaking for a while now <laughs> Good when you speak for a while. All right, Chuta, we read the verses. Now enlighten us. No pressure. No pressure. We did what you asked. <laughs> I was uh I was just kind of thinking about this twofold. Um for those of us who think, well, I'll just stop eating dairy and then that will cure all the problems um even our so-called like detaching ourselves from the system uh in whatever way we think we are detaching ourselves at some point krishna's like that's that's not going to work as well as you think that that's going to work because that full detachment isn't really possible um we are always kind of dependent on this uh like this this interrelationship between the elements and us even if it's between devas that we may or may not believe in and us and and it's one of those things it's like well if I don't believe in the devas, then why am I entering into this contract with them? It's like, it doesn't matter. You, you are, you've entered into the contract simply by living. Um, it's like, and I've used this, this example before when people are like, I don't believe in gravity. And it's like, well, yes, but it's still working whether, whether or not we believe in the gravity or the science or whatever it is. So just being, in this material world we've entered into this contract and there is hopefully a, a synergistic collaboration that will occur hopefully in the in the best case scenario um and i think that rather than frustrating ourselves by condemning our work and condemning our place here uh krishna is advising us to in some ways flow with it He's saying, he's like, you know, you, you know, you're never going to be absolved of all work because Arjuna is really trying to absolve himself from this whole situation. I could just leave. It'll be fine. And Krishna is saying, well, it won't be fine. You've already you've already been enmeshed in this in this web. You've already been in this contract. Um, we're we're all in this contract. And I think it's really interesting that this is Krishna saying this when at seven years old he told his father the complete opposite when his father was saying that you know we we subsist on on grains and in order for our crops to grow we need rain and in order for rain to happen we need indra and so we should all worship indra properly like we should give back to the devas because we've entered into this contract and krishna kind of is like uh, indra's just doing his job why should we thank him why should we give anything to Indra? In fact, you know what? We are really actually dependent on, on Mount Govardhan. Let, let's give all of our, our worship to Mount Govardhan. And, but, but Nanda Maharaj is now saying, but 
this is a, a Vedic interaction, like told by the Vedas and Upanishads and Puranas, etc. There will be dire consequences if we refuse to act in accordance to the with the rules of of nature. Which is like, yeah, it'll be all right. And there actually were some intense consequences. So I think it's it's very interesting that this same Krishna is now going mm. back and saying, you know, we're already in this in this in this contract. Um, and the only way to actually really circumvent that contract, get around that contract, is to work in favor of Lord Vishnu, which is the one point that makes both of those stories line up. Mm. Really, at seven years old, Krishna tells the whole village, look, yes, I know that you've been in contract with this demigod. He gives rain, you give thanks, all of the things. Otherwise, you're a thief. But surrender to my instructions. I'll take care of you. And at the same point, he's telling Arjuna this same thing. Unless you surrender to my instructions and let me take care of you, you're always going to be in this contract. It's a tangled web. You can't get out of it. I really appreciate making that parallel between uh, the Govardhan Lila. For those unfamiliar, it's a story of of the same Krishna who's speaking about Bhagavad Gita um, prior to this um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's so important when we're reading something to look at it within the context of the greater teachings in which it exists. Um, because sometimes you might find something, uh, Rupa Goswami um, wrote once that when you find two things in Shastra that seem contradictory, rather than trying to prove one over the other, find ways in which they're both true. You know, find ways in which they actually complement each other um, rather than trying to use one as a sledgehammer to pound out the other. Um, and I think so often we find in religious or spiritual circles, we we pick up, you know, there's the uh, a word for verse in Sanskrit is a shloka. And there's the phrase different shlokes for different folks. <laughs> According to who you are, you can find a verse anywhere and use it to justify anything. You can pick, you know, whether it's related to gender, whether it's related to race, whether it's related to uh politics or you know like obviously jesus was a democrat obviously jesus was a republican you know obviously this that or the other obviously you know uh you know christian would have felt this on this particular issue and this and that according to this verse or Prabhupada would have felt this way and so we just usually have a particular mindset and then we find a verse to justify that and you can find something to justify anything as opposed to what is the higher principle here actually is that I'm actually and and I think the 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 thread of this whole section is is service. I'm actually trying to align my will with higher will. And I remember at the beginning of this year, this is we've all we've been doing this podcast for almost a year, guys. You know that we're celebrating our our one year anniversary. Um, but at the beginning of this, when when we were experiencing January at the front end of 2022. And uh, Avir was a guest on the podcast and he was talking about this process of like creating vision boards for your life. And what do you want your, what do you want your year to be like? And, 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 and stepping back and thinking like, God, what do you want my life to be like? Like, what is the divine plan that's waiting for me? And how do I discover that and align myself with that? And I think that, you know, the last thing that I'll share, I've been taking this, Um, I read yet, yeah, I read earlier this week. I've been taking somebody recommended to me this kind of like um, online module course about mental fitness, about like changing kind of like your mental patterns and how you think and and shifting your mindset. And and much of it is like practical and tangible. Like there's like there's these exercises throughout the day where you literally pause and disrupt your mental patterns and like use this word self command. Like you do these very short, even like 30 second to minute meditations where you're just absorbing your consciousness in like one central experience, like the feeling of your fingers rubbing together or like paying very close attention to like a sound that you're hearing. So it's almost kind of like, you know, our minds are being, our mind is being uh, constantly pulled. We're not choosing where our attention goes so often. So it's like a practice of like actually rebuilding neural pathways to like focus your attention where you choose to. And he had this thing that when you want to change something in your life, he said 20% of it 
is insight. So let's say you read something, 20% of it is insight and 80% of it is actual mental fitness. Actually, 80% of it is like, you know, let's say I want to be healthier and I want to like, you know, actually do something physically with my body. 20% is the insight of like how to live a better life. And 80% is my actual ability to like exercise and, and grow muscle and develop. And he said the same thing in our, in our mental lives. And so I was thinking about in relation to this section where Krishna's, you know, there's so many insights in the Gita where we, we want to live a life of surrender. We want to understand what it means to love. We want to know what it means to align ourselves with a higher will rather than being dictated by my mind and my senses and my ego. And Krishna's giving in this section, like the very practical <laughs> spiritual fitness exercises to start doing that. Just give a little bit back. Just learn to like give a little of what you have away, whether it's your time, your money, your energy, your intelligence, like start to give it back. Um, even just the process of learning how to flex that selfless muscle, that surrender muscle, that giving muscle, that loving muscle. Um, it doesn't have to be these big sweeping changes, but like start giving back, start participating in this cycle of reciprocity and reciprocal attention and relationships. And so um, I really appreciate, I don't know if I've, I went on a tangent or if that's connected to what you guys shared, forgive me. It's okay, you just, you just give me a thumbs up, great. Um, what, I think one time when, when I was having a just, it was just Kishore and I having conversation. I just realized that my strategy here is that I, I pick a train of thought that I'm really inspired by. I go and then I run out of gas and then I have to turn it over to one of you guys. And so I just ran out of gas. <laughs> I hope that something I shared was helpful. Pick it up, somebody. Uh, I, I think it was really helpful because. <laughs> Thank you. I think it was really helpful because it is really interesting. And, and just the way that I am, am digesting this too, is that it is really helpful to understand that, that like 20% is, is like the, the, the aha moment of like, something needs to shift or I need to, I need to change something or like, yeah, this is how I'm going to do it. And it's all here. And then 80% is like you said, it's like, it's like the actual doing of it or like the actual like do i have the the where the, the internal strength and wherewithal to like push through and push through my old habits and push through kind of the things that are keeping me from this habit that i want to have or this person that i want to be or this you know mental physical place that i want to be in or at and then just to bring it back to this this um because i really love what achuta said too of like connecting the govardhan lila and this and and really understanding like instead of i love how you how you said that dayal about rupa goswami instead of trying to like prove one thing versus the other how can they both make sense at the same time and i think it's for this whole section about sacrifice and doing things for vishnu or doing things for krishna it's such an important point points that both of you have brought up because it always comes back to that in a sense like it's it's almost like this litmus test of like why am I doing the mental fitness test? Or like, why is Krishna saying this here to Arjuna, but he's saying that over there to Nanda Maharaj and the, you know, the residents of Vrindavan? It's like, we can always kind of come back to this question or, or this answer of like, is it pleasing to Krishna? Did it please Krishna? Was it for that greater, you know, satisfaction of of Krishna. And it's it's like we can ask that from a Shastric perspective, looking at two different stories and then uh, pastimes. And we can also ask that to ourselves. Like, did I actually do this for, you know, and this is rhetorical for right now. <laughs> it cannot be rhetorical for yourself at home. But, you know, I, I tend to ask myself that sometimes a lot. I'm like, am I actually doing this for Krishna? Like, come on, let's be let's be real. Like, let's be real. Am I actually doing this for Krishna or for my bhakti? Or is this something that I'm just kind of like being um, flippant about and just kind of like going on my whims and, and being taken by the, you know, by the excitement of the experience. And it's a really good litmus test. It, it's really good. It can, it can sometimes be kind of confronting. It can sometimes be like, uh, you know, I can speak for myself. Sometimes I don't want to take that litmus test. I'm just like, no, I'm just, I'm just doing things. It's everything's cool. I'm just a New Yorker 
just I'm just excited and loud and it's great and I'm just doing things and it's like you don't want to ask sometimes those deeper questions but it is um it is really important to do so um and it's also important to do so for yourself and also have trusted safe um community and people around you that can hold you accountable for that as well um obviously in a mutual agreement not someone just like being there like hey you didn't do that for krishna but like you know in a way that it feels safe in a way that it feels like this is a really beautiful reminder of like oh yeah that's right we're supposed to be doing this or this is this is the mood that we're supposed to be having um so yeah litmus test yes <laughs> Oh, I think we're running fresh out of time. Oh my God, Krishna. We were in fresh out of time. Oh, Krishna. <laughs> uh, this is where we turn to Kimberly. Kimberly has so many beautiful takeaway points for us that we can keep in our pocket and take with us. And then we'll have a few closing words. So give it to us, Kimberly. All right. Today we're taking away that full detachment is impossible. Just by being in the material world, we have entered into a contract. Um, so we should align our will with a higher will, give to receive, and flex that reciprocity muscle. Closing words, Kishore Achita. Terms and conditions apply. <laughs> Terms and conditions apply. I really, I really love that. I love whenever you say that at Chute because it's always a really good reminder. And I, I also Does love. Does she say that often? She says she's definitely said it many times on this podcast, many, many times. Maybe I don't like it, and I'm just unconsciously <laughs> deleting it from my memory. Maybe that's what's going on. <laughs> I really like what Kimberly said of flexing that reciprocity muscle, and 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 even more than flexing it, I think it's just like a. That reciprocity is always available to us, actually. Um, it's always there. And and I think it's like that that litmus test that I was talking about of like, who am I doing this for really? The more I can answer that question honestly um, and sincerely, the more that reciprocity will become evident to me, that it's always there for me. Um, so it's a nice reminder. Thank you, Kimberly. That's my takeaway. Mm, thank you. I, I really loved, I mentioned this earlier, just Achuta's parallel of, of, of Krishna in the Govardhan Leela and Krishna in this, in this verse here. And it's just bringing it to the point of ele elevating, elevating the, the situation to like, what's the higher principle? What's the higher principle here? And in so many times, it's easy to get into an argument with somebody. It's easy to get into an argument with myself and to judge on myself or to, to, to get worried about what I should or shouldn't do. And just to always come back to this place of <clears throat> what's the higher principle here? What's the higher principle? Um, and the higher principle is um, <clears throat> the higher principle is operating from a place of wanting to engage in loving service to divine higher self and to divine Krishna. And, to each other so thank you for giving that reminder and thank you for elevating me and everyone else around us and thank you all for being here we have a live zoom studio audience if you want to get on our zoom crew just go to the bucky center website find spirit matters and there's a zoom link there somewhere <laughs> or write to us at spirit matters at bucky center.org if you have any questions if you have a question you want us to read on an episode let us know um Either way, we love you and grateful for you, and we will see you all again soon. Bye-bye.